So what we're going to look at is basically, well, what are the general trends or in terms of general properties that we see of an element and its position on the periodic table? Can we find any sort of relationship between where an element sits and what properties it would have, okay? In general, elements on the left-hand side, so the way the yellow arrow is pointing, are metals. So they're solid at room temperature, great electrical conductors, great thermal conductors, and are malleable and ductile. All of those things we talked about in previous lessons. So on the left-hand side, we're likely to find metals. And if I was to go and tell someone that, elements on the left-hand side of the periodic table are metals, and they knew what a metal was, they could go to their periodic table and point out maybe, say, magnesium, and say, look, I don't know what this is exactly, but I could guess, because I know what a metal is, that it's probably a good electrical conductor and all of these other things. So you can see that because they know it's on the left, they, they instantly know its properties, okay? Because they know it's a metal. So that's one thing that we can sort of draw out. Now, as we go from left to right, so from that way to this way, this blue arrow sort of pointing at the non-metals, the metallic character of elements decreases. When we go from the left-hand side, with the exception of hydrogen, we notice that elements that, as we go this way, start to lose their metallic character. They look less like metals. Elements on this side are much less like metals than these guys. And that makes sense, right? Because this side is non-metal. So as you go from left to right, elements start to stop looking like metals and begin looking like non-metals. Okay? And then there's this transitional period here, these white elements, which are the semi-metals. And so they sort of bridge the gap between metals and non-metals. And as you move down the periodic table or down the groups, so you move down this way, the metallic character of elements tends to increase. As you go this way and this way down, this bottom chemical will start to look more like a metal than this top one. And that's just because of the way the, you know, the electrons are structured, which we'll talk about in future lessons. So basically, that summarizes the sort of physical properties that we can see from the periodic table. Chemical properties uh, so for physical properties, there's not much we can sort of draw out from this because the periodic table doesn't tell us a lot about physical properties. But those are the general things we can draw out from the periodic table. Now, chemical properties is a whole different story, and we'll be talking about that in the next lesson. Chemical properties, we can learn a lot from the periodic table about what a chemical is likely to do based on where it sits on the periodic table. So that concludes today's lesson on properties and the periodic table, or physical properties and the periodic table. So we looked at how the placement on the periodic table tells us some things about the physical properties of a particular chemical and how and what trends we can draw out by looking at the periodic table. Okay? Now which elements from the periodic table are highly reactive metals? Okay, so from what we talked about where do we find metals? Well, it's all these yellow ones. So it's somewhere here. That doesn't help us too much, but it helps us a little bit. At least we know that it's not this section. Now, highly reactive? Well, if I was to guess, if I was a you know, betting man, I would say that if these are the very stable ones, if I go to the opposite end, I'll find the very reactive ones. And that kind of logic is actually correct because group one, is the most reactive metal compounds. This is due to the fact that they only have one electron in their outer shell, and so they really just want to get rid of it and react with something. So that makes them very reactive. And again, we'll go through in ionic bonding what happens with each of these metals. Okay. Now, since it only needs to remove one electron, it will readily react with lots of different compounds. And again, when I go through ionic bonding, that will become clear to you. Okay. So, which elements from the periodic table would have the following properties? Brittle, generally low density, and most of them exist as gases. Well, if you were to guess, well, if you not guess, sorry, you know this one. These properties are non-metal properties. So, we'd be looking somewhere over this side. And we know that non-metals are the blue ones, so we generally pick these blue ones, as well as hydrogen on the left. These are all... All, well, most of them exhibit these properties, with the exception of maybe carbon. They're non-metals. 
And why is helium preferred to hydrogen for use in a balloon? So why do we like helium more than hydrogen? And it's not because it makes our voice really high, because I'm sure hydrogen would do that as well. But that's not the reason. Where is helium? It's here. And these guys we just mentioned are very stable. And those guys over there are very reactive. So that might lead us onto the right path. So helium is a noble gas, as highlighted, and thus is very unreactive. Hydrogen, however, is a very reactive gas um, that reacts with oxygen to create water and a lot of heat. By storing the hydrogen in a balloon, there's potential explosion hazard. And just keep in mind where we see balloons. We generally see balloons at birthday parties. And what is a key feature of a birthday party? A birthday cake. And the cake has candles on it. And if you've got something that's flammable near candles, that's obviously not a great move on your part. So helium is a much safer choice compared to hydrogen. And that's shown in the whole Hindenburg blimp incident. It's pretty obvious why hydrogen's the bad choice for balloons. Okay.